Good evening. I'm Chris Reisenman, and I'm with the League of Women Voters of Sonoma County. We welcome you to the final class in this civic series brought to you by the Sonoma County League. The League of Women Voters is a nonpartisan grassroots organization working to protect and expand voting rights, encourage informed and active participation uh, in government, and to ensure that everyone is represented in our democracy. We empower voters and defend democracy through education and advocacy at all levels of government. I encourage you to join a local league near you to further the cause of democracy in our nation. This is the final class in a series of three. The first class, presented by SSU political science professor David McEwen, discussed how California's state government works. The second class, conducted by California legislative aide Logan Pitts, focused on how an idea becomes a law. If you missed either of those classes, you can now view them online on the LVW Sonoma YouTube channel. Tonight, Steve Rabinowich will be talking about how our local city and county governments work. Most people are aware of what happens at the federal level, but fewer people are aware of what happens locally in their city and county. And yet the local level is where democracy begins with us. Even if you don't live in Sonoma County, we believe you'll find this class very useful. And now for some housekeeping. Steve will talk for about 40 minutes and then we'll open up for questions and answers. You may use the Q&A in Zoom to submit your questions. Our question moderator, Karen Weeks, will ask as many questions as time permits. Although we don't anticipate any issues, in the event of technical difficulties, please remain on the Zoom. Know that we'll be working behind the scenes to correct any issues and get everything back online as soon as possible. As always, we ask that you be respectful and adhere to civil discourse in your questions. We're delighted to have Steve Rabinowich with us this evening. Steve has been an esteemed and longstanding professor of political science at Santa Rosa Junior College for over 25 years, as well as an active and engaged participant in local government here in Sonoma County. He served on the Santa Rosa City Council from 1998 to 2006, and he was instrumental in establishing the Sonoma County Agricultural Preservation and Open Space District. He is currently chair of the City of Santa Rosa Waterways Advisory Committee and active in the Southeast Greenway Campaign, an effort to purchase and create a 47-acre greenway in Santa Rosa. In 2023, he was awarded a Merit Award from the City of Santa Rosa as a community hero. And now, I'd like to introduce and welcome Steve Rabinowish. Well, thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be here. I'm honored really to be a participant in this great series. The other speakers were excellent. And uh, I think this is an incredibly valuable exercise for people. So my hope tonight really is to be able to convey to you the um, importance of being involved in local government and the opportunities it has and the rewards it has both to you and to your community. So um, I would like to um, also mention, I'll be talking a lot about local government and some of it is in the context of our community where I live, Santa Rosa. A lot of it is applicable to California and I hope to make it applicable to your areas as well. But I do encourage you to look into the types of information I'm presenting uh, as far as what local governments are doing in your area and what opportunities there are for you all to be involved as well. So with that, I'm going to start the slideshow, and I'm going to talk to you about the uh, way local government works, and also um, we'll be talking about, uh, as I said, opportunities, but I'm going to do look at some case studies about how I have been involved in uh, local government and how you could be. So we're going to also look at regional government to be, uh, begin with, but you can see here what we're going to be uh, considering here uh, in this presentation. I hope you can all see this uh, information clearly. Is it coming out okay? I hope so. Okay, so um, first of all, we do have uh, some regional agencies in our area and you will probably as well. Um, because if you live in an urban area, there will be uh, regional uh, councils of government. Uh, we have ABAG, Association of Barrier Governments. It's a volunteer organization in the sense that 
local governments are members of this organization and it does planning and studies on uh, housing and population growth and employment growth and economic development in the nine county bay area it also does the the regional um, housing needs allocation which is very significant in terms of affordable housing so um, I think it is important for you to look at that website sometime. And if you're interested in the affordable housing issue, it's quite significant. The Metropolitan Transportation Commission is also a volunteer organization in the sense that local governments are members. Neither of these organizations have direct power over local governments. They, in the case of the Metropolitan Transportation Commission, uh, the uh, role there is to take federal grants, state grants, bridge tolls, and other sources of revenue and allocate those to the, the Bay Area cities and counties for different types of transportation improvements. So again, it's a very significant regional agency. Now to talk about uh, county government, um, there are 58 counties in California. They're created by the state. Those boundaries stay the same. They do not change. Uh, and uh, we've had that configuration for many years. The counties are governed by a board of supervisors, typically five members elected by districts. So after the uh, census is done every 10 years, there is a redistricting effort and those districts are adopted by the county board of supervisors. Uh, it's a nonpartisan election that elects the county supervisors. And that's the case with local governments, city councils, uh, school districts, and uh, judges and other local officials are uh, on a ballot, but they are in a nonpartisan framework. In other words, they don't, do not run by political party. Um, and the, um, the county uh, is, like I said, run by the Board of Supervisors, but there are also other elected positions, which we'll talk about in a minute. Now here you can see some examples of the other elected officials. You have on the top here, the Board of Supervisors. Under them is the county administrator who administers the various departments under the board. But you can see here there are other elected officials. There's, in, there's the auditor, controller, treasurer, tax collector. There's the county clerk, recorder, uh, assessor, the district attorney, the sheriff coroner, and you can see over here superior court judges. So these are elected positions and these people do uh, run the agencies within county government, but they're not directly under the control uh, or supervision of the uh, board of supervisors. There are certainly uh, close relationships. Um, and in many cases there are uh, you know, processes that involve all of them together, but there is independence of these agencies. Now, uh, something I'd like to mention is a difference between incorporated and unincorporated areas. So incorporated areas are cities, as you probably know. The unincorporated areas are outside of the cities and often referred to as being in the county. So I'm differentiating between those because I want to explain something to you about county functions. And you can see here that the county government role um, is um, kind of complex because they do provide some services that the state of California runs, um, like social services, public health, you can see the others here, um, that are uh, run for residents in all parts of the county. And you can also see here that there are other services that are run for the whole county, uh, which are available to all of us, like going to county parks, uh, the bus, in our county, the open space uh, program we have and flood control. And you can also see here that there is a, um, an incorporated areas which receive other services from the county uh, because they are ones that are involving different types of um, services that cities would provide, provide inside their boundary, but county provides outside. Like planning, for example, they have to adopt a general plan for the area outside the county zoning of parcels outside the cities, roads outside the cities, and of law enforcement. So I just wanted to let you know that there are some different um, activities that counties do that cities uh, do not. 
Cities are formed by the citizens, the residents, I should say, um, according to uh, state law. Um, and they are uh, either at large or district elections which govern. They can either be a council manager form of government um, with a mayor um, selected by the council. This is called a weak mayor system because they are selected by the city council. And then a mayor council form of government, which can be in a small city, but is also found in large cities where they may have a strong mayor system, some of the larger cities uh, where they have um, uh, a directly elected mayor who would have more power over the uh, staffing of the city and more power over the budget and may even have veto power. So the mayor uh, council role is a somewhat different form, as I said. Um, the city council um, role is basically to provide constituent services, budget approval, land use decisions, and determine policy. Um, which is then carried out by the uh, city manager in the majority of our cities, which are council manager form. One other thing I wanted to mention is an innovative program we have here in, in Sonoma County, which is urban growth boundaries. And an urban growth boundary is, for example, you will see here in the city we live in here, the outer boundary of Santa Rosa, for example. And this is the case in all nine cities in Sonoma County. And what that means is that there, in addition to the city limits line around cities, there is another boundary line that's established by the voters, it was established by election in all nine cities. And it is a, a boundary past which the city may not extend water, sewer, or other public services or annex other properties. And that was done in Sonoma County because of the desire to have urban growth more densely and more clearly defined within the urban areas and to protect agriculture and open space in surrounding areas. So this is something unique uh, in a sense, um, and it is something that the voters approve for a 20 year period, and then they will vote again to reauthorize it or not to, if, after that 20 year period. You can see here some of the typical departments that are in cities, and one thing you will notice is that uh, they're not as complex, not as uh, deep as some of the functions of counties. They deal mostly with uh, issues regarding uh, basic services, but fire, police, our road system, and our system of uh, bikeways and pedestrian uh, improvements, water, wastewater. You can tell here that the uh, types of programs that are offered in cities are, are quite different and not as complex in terms of social services that are mainly funded and provided by the uh, counties. Special districts are formed basically um, to um, provide a specific service, as you can tell here, oftentimes in the unincorporated areas of the county, but not always. Uh, but they are formed um, by the residents with approval by an agency called LAFCO, which is a county organization within the county government. Um, and they have independent boards of directors, generally, as I say here, funded by property taxes or sales taxes in some cases. And as I note here, there are various types of them, probably the most common are school districts around the state, but also water districts, sewer districts, fire districts, and others. Um, and also, I would like to just mention that in Sonoma County, we have a couple districts which are uh, rather unique. We have a uh, regional transportation district called SMART, Sonoma Marin Area Regional Transportation District. It's a two county organization. In other words, it's involving both Marin County and Sonoma County. And the board of directors is, are local officials from both of those counties. And it was established by a vote in the two counties uh, by the people. It was uh, then uh, uh, another vote for the uh, levying of a, a sales tax, which is a quarter of 1% sales tax approved by the voters with a two thirds vote. And uh, that board continues to um, uh, construct a rail line that goes between Larkspur and eventually Cloverdale in our county. 
Another county district we have is the Agricultural Preservation and Open Space District, which I was directly involved with from the very beginning in the election in 1990, where a district was established for the county and a levy of a two thirds of a tax, uh, two thirds vote for a sales tax was approved uh, as well. And again, that's a one quarter of 1% sales tax. So these are special districts as well, but they are countywide, uh, I guess you would say, in the case of open space district and a two county special district in the case of the smart train. What I'd like to really focus on tonight with you are examples of projects. And these are ones I have been involved with. I'm not gonna take credit for all the things that I'm gonna show you tonight because I was directly involved, but there were many others as well. On a cold December morning in 1989, I was invited along with six other people to go look at our creek or what was our creek. Um, Santa Rosa Creek, uh, which feeds into the Russian River and then into the ocean, it bisects our community, had flooding in the 1960s. And it was so severe that there was a project to channelize the creek with a three foot of uh, concrete lining the channel. Um, and in doing so, they created a channel uh, to take floodwaters out of the city quickly. In doing so, you can tell what happened to the riparian vegetation, which was removed, and it had tremendous impacts on our fish population, our coho salmon. And uh, we have had uh, problems with uh, it being a threatened species. Um, and our interest in seeing this was, you know, thinking about not just the tragedy of a creek being converted into a, just a flood channel, but the hope that we could actually construct and reconstruct a creek to be created here that could carry the floodwaters, but could also uh, be an environmental benefit to our community. And you can see tonight, today what it looks like in, in terms of an aerial view. And you can also see that there is a uh, whole host of improvements that were done to the area with the creation of a bikeway, uh, making it accessible to the surrounding areas and, and including a great deal of public art as well along the, uh, the greenway itself. Um, so it was a project that took many years. It probably took 10 years to even get the first uh, piece of the concrete removed, but it was all removed. The channel was redone into being more of a uh, more of a natural channel, but not entirely because we were constricted into space in terms of the space surrounding the creek. But the benefits are tremendous. It is a bikeway that is part of a bikeway system in our county. Uh, the environmental impacts of the uh, changes to the riparian vegetation are significant, as you can tell. Well, how did it all happen? That's what I want to focus on with you for a minute, because um, what happened by after the small group got together, we started researching at how local government works. How do we actually do something about this? We had no idea at the beginning. Um, we started talking to the city and the county, which had jurisdiction over the creek itself. Um, we started uh, creating a vision with the community. Uh, got a, a group of people together, including staff, city council members, and people who are neighbors or landowners along the Greenway. All types of people came to a visioning exercise we had, and we published a pamphlet that really created what we hoped was the vision for what could happen to improve this creek. We partnered with the county, community groups, the city, and we started to have a lot of support from local government officials and a city, uh, a Creek master plan was produced for Santa Rosa Creek. Later, several years later, uh, it was so important that the city created a citywide Creek master plan um, and created a waterways advisory committee, which I um, chair. Uh, so I've been involved in this project since 1990 in one way or another. Um, and that, of course, brings up the fact you need people to stay the course and to be involved, and you need community groups that will support a project. These are, in many ways, are 
elements that are needed for any major project that is created in local government. And the opportunities are tremendous to be able to do so, but it takes a lot of work and research to be able to accomplish it. We obtained many federal and state grants for the uh, project, including um, state, federal government, and this county open space district I mentioned. In fact, over $25 million was um, funded. Um, and it was not funded by general fund revenues, which are what we would uh, talk about when we talk about police, fire, or other uh, services to the residents. These are funds that came into the community to fund this project. But over the years, it became somewhat neglected, and we then realized we need to um, reinvigorate it to get people down there again, to uh, have regular maintenance, to have more events there. And there's a new group that is volunteering. They're called the Friends of the Prince Group Memorial Greenway, a wonderful organization that is trying to reinvigorate this creek itself and to bring back uh, people to the area. And it really has tremendous potential. So this is a wonderful, wonderful project that I, I feel very good about. And uh, every time I see people riding their bike there, it gives me pleasure. Forming a Citizens Academy. This is another effort that I uh, decided to uh, work on when I was on the city council. And um, I had discussions with a, uh, the president of the League of Women Voters at that time, Susan Gorin, who is now a County Board of Supervisors member. And we talked about forming a Citizens Academy where we would have uh, the city sponsor uh, a, an educational program for residents and others to learn about the different departments of the city and how they operated. Well, this worked well for uh, uh, over a year, but it eventually was of de determined by the city that it was too complicated to continue. I didn't really have support um, to be able to continue this program indefinitely, um, but I think it had an impact and I'm only bringing it up because I think there is potential here in uh, your area uh, or other areas to be able to uh, have a similar type of organization. So I heard about it, you know, um, you don't, there are a lot of things going on in local governments that other local governments uh, learn about um, and, and can replicate. So you don't have to always reinvent the wheel. There are pro programs that if we do, if we study the way cities work and what kind of programs are benefiting the residents, we can create programs within our own community. So this is just an idea. Um, I think it's hard for a city to or a county to provide this on their own, but a nonprofit organization could do so. Invite um, representatives of cities, um, of county, of uh, school districts, um, and to have a, an educational program, maybe a weekly program for six weeks or whatever. It could be run through a continuing education program at a community college even. Uh, it just takes people to be able to uh, work on this kind of a, a program. But I think it has potential because the more people learn about how government works, the more potential there is for involvement. Funding public art. Well, I, when I was on the council, I always also heard about other programs in cities that had programs for public art. And I thought it was a wonderful way to beautify our city. And so what it basically means is that a 1% levy is a um, fee um, is required of commercial projects, shopping centers, retail, uh, manufacturing kinds of uh, projects that are constructed, which would either put in art on their buildings or um, in their property uh, worth 1% of the value of their construction costs or uh, donate that money to the city's art program and then the city would commission public art. And that's what happened in these two cases. This was money that came from this 1% for art program that then was spent for commissioning art. So like everything else, you know, if you're a public official, it's very important, I think, to focus on what you can accomplish because you do have an opportunity to be in the inside of how policy is made. Um, you do need supportive groups, just like the Prince Memorial Greenway. We need advocacy by public groups to help you, your project gain notoriety and get public support. In this case, I got 
um, help from the city manager and we met with the developers in the community, tailored the program so it could get support. We didn't want to tech, uh, have a, a fee on housing, for example. Uh, we wanted to do it on commercial development. So um, I was advocating for the program, finally got council support, not unanimous, but we did get council support and this program is still in existence after many years. So this is a program I think that has a long time span as long as you have council and political support. Well, another program that um, I am working on is the uh, Southeast Greenway. And this is a really fascinating uh, program. Um, it, the Southeast Greenway um, is a project that is occurring on what was to be an extension of a state highway through the middle of Santa Rosa, up and over Spring Lake Park, a beautiful park in our community. And the proposal then was uh, debated in the community. Uh, and finally, uh, there was so much opposition to this highway extension that the city and the state Caltrans, uh, California Department of Transportation, uh, essentially let it go and didn't pursue it. So what you're seeing here is the right of way from uh, what we call Montgomery High School on the left uh, to uh, all the way up, up and into Spring Lake Park, which is part of a city, county, and state park complex, a real treasure in our community. So it leaked fallow for many years until a group of citizens decided they wanted to have a greenway in this area. And that, now that was over 16 years ago that a group of citizens decided that they wanted to work on this greenway. That group is still in existence. They have incredible energy and staying power. And I've been involved with it for 12 years partially because I wanted to make it happen. I enjoy these long-term transformational projects, but I also uh, had some experience in this kind of a, an issue before. So uh, what happened is that we are now on the verge of acquiring this property. I have to buy it from Caltrans, and we're on the verge of doing so within the next couple of months, and then we will have a parks master plan to create the actual greenway itself, and the, the community will be involved uh, certainly uh, directly in deciding what they would like to see on this property. So again, a group sees an opportunity, attracts members, creates an organization. In this case, it's the Southeast Greenway campaign, tries to figure out how you get approval of this kind of a complex project and works with the community and neighbors, just like we did on the Prince Memorial Greenway. The group agreed to raise all funds they needed to buy the property and to not to put the burden on the city of Santa Rosa to do it. It also started to raise money for mailings, uh, attends all meetings um, in uh, the deal with this project and tries to raise awareness. I mean, that's an ongoing effort to try to create awareness of a project and support within the community because that's what it really takes. And it has to be a long-term uh, effort to uh, sustain this kind of support for a project. It takes staying power, and this group certainly has it. So this has continued. Um, it's not done yet, but it, what happened that really put it over the top was a partnership with the city, the county, and Sonoma Land Trust and a group called Land Paths to uh, form a partnership of agencies. And this is also so important to solve problems uh, because it, we, you can't just be in a silo when you're in the public sector. It's important to work together and that does happen regularly, but we put together a partnership um, and in doing so, it has um, been very successful at uh, continuing this project. So you can see some of the other things that we've done here and we've continued to advocate for the project in terms of a goals and uh, that the city council puts together and um, a budget for the uh, parks department to be able to do maintenance on this property. And we're on the verge of making it happen. And the thing is very interesting. This project has been going on for 16 years and we, we still have not directly been able to walk on the property. It is the state's property and we are about to acquire it. And that is really, really exciting. So the next step is to raise funds for a parks master plan to work with the community, the neighborhood to determine what specific uses it will be. 
So in essence, you know, there are a lot of similarities to the projects I'm talking about. Um, and if you really want to be effective, I think, in local government, and it is open to all of us, it's amazing how open the process is with regular meetings where you can attend, uh, local officials, easy to contact, and staff members who are really important and should be oftentimes the first place you go if you have questions about how get, to get things done. But low, keeping up with the local news, um, learning more about how your city and county operate, getting email updates, these are just really basic. Um, and then keeping up with what the issues are that are being decided on the local level. I think it's important to figure out what you really care about and find an issue that really means something to you because I, I have done that in my life and that has inspired me. Um, and so uh, I've joined groups and partnered with others to try to uh, make these kinds of projects happen as many, many people do. Uh, you meet some fascinating people and it has lots of rewards, I would say to you personally. Think about getting appointed to a board or commission. You know, there are boards and commissions at the city level and at the county level. The elected officials look for individuals in the community to serve. And there are many types of boards or commissions that you can uh, uh, be a member of. I think it's highly rewarding. And so I encourage you to look at the website of your local government and see what possibilities there are and uh, contact your local officials if you're interested in uh, serving. So one other thing is timing. So uh, there are different processes that occur and it's um, important to know when those processes are occurring because oftentimes we come in uh, and say, well, we need more money for maintaining parks and you do it in the middle of a year when the budget is already created. That's not as easy to, uh, for the city to adjust to doing anything other than its normal activities. Uh, it's important to be there at goal setting when the local officials set their goals for the following year, when they create a budget. Um, it's very important to go to the budget meetings and advocate for the project you care about. Um, and also when a general plan is being done by your city or county, um, it's very important to participate. That's a time when the things you care about can be included in the plan for your city. I'm not saying you can't get things done other than those times, but those are particularly opportune for you to be able to be involved in. Um, and other processes, review of a city charter, uh, redistricting, these are all times when there, there are some fundamental decisions being made. So as you can tell, nothing happens fast. Um, there are projects that take a long time and need um, patience <laughs> and uh, staying power. Um, it's super important to show up, um, to be at meetings. Um, you don't need to have 15 people speak at a city council meeting. You can have two or three from your group speak and all the people who are attending from your group can sit together in the council chamber, even wear a green t-shirt as they do with the Southeast Greenway campaign. Um, but show up at meetings. Um, you, you really need to be there, I think, to get the attention of the local officials. Celebrate your accomplishments, super important. And also invite the officials, both staff and elected officials who helped you get to where you, you are, uh, because that is really important to be able to celebrate together with the people who are you're working with in the local level. Enjoy your involvement, as I say, it matters. And I think you will get great satisfaction from being involved. And I hope, um, all of you find something that you really care about. I'm sure many of you are involved now and many of you are doing the kinds of things I'm discussing with you today. But I hope that by preventing, uh, presenting some of these uh, case studies, if you will, you kind of get a sense of the things you need to do to be able to, to get projects done. In addition, I just wanted to put together some sources of information for you that you can use uh, and um, I'll leave it at that. So um, with that, um, I would like to uh, stop this um, the slide presentation and uh, uh, I'll take, we can take it back to our um, hosts and uh, we can see where we can take questions.
Great. <laughs> Thank you, Steve, so much. Um, first of all, I just want to mention to everybody, I have a cold, and so that's why my voice is the way it is. Hopefully you can understand me and hear me. Um, and with Zoom, I'm not contagious. So um, one of the, we had a couple questions um, about charter city versus general law city and what's the difference and in Sonoma County, what's a charter city and what's not a charter city? Well, they're called, they're either general law cities, which where the structure of the city particularly is set up by um, state law. Um, and typically there are five members and the uh, it's at large elections um, and uh, the functions of the city council are established by the state. But the city charter allows you more flexibility in terms of how your government, local government is structured, um, how many people you have on your city council, um, and um, it gives you more uh, flexibility. Uh, oftentimes the pay that uh, salary that is given to the uh, members of the city council is established at, in the charter. And I know the person who is questioning me today is was on the charter committee in our city and could probably answer the question even better than I, but I won't put that on you. But it gives you more flexibility um, in terms of uh, how the uh, city is structured, essentially. Great, thank you. Um, so the, with the Board of Supervisors, they also act as um, a board for special districts. They do. Um, in some cases. Few of them. And so yeah. is that typical? Do you know for no. other counties or is that, do you know why that I, is the way it is? I wouldn't say it's typical. You know, um, when you th think about school districts or you think about water districts or sewer districts or park districts, those are typically formed by the residents who live in that particular area. And the boards are locally um, elected by the residents of those particular districts, which are also where the tax would be collected. But the Board of Supervisors are um, on the boards of the two uh, districts I mentioned, the uh, open space district and the smart uh, districts, no member in area rail transit. And that is, um, I don't know how typical it is, but it is, um, what it does is it um, creates a, um, a leadership of a district uh, that is accountable to the public in the sense of having uh, elected officials in charge of it rather than than others. So it's kind of a little more continuity with the city and, and the county that it, it is located in. Great. Um, you talked a little bit about LAFCO. Um, is LAFCO um, accountable to the Board of Supervisors or what influence do city governments have um, to, to LAFCO? LAFCO is independent of the city. Cities do not really have direct any direct control over LAFCO. The, the county does. Um, but LAFCO's job is really to um, evaluate, um, for example, if residents want to uh, incorporate and create a city, um, they would um, have to vote on it. But, uh, or there would be petitions first of 25% of the residents, for example. It would start a process where LAFCO would then do a study uh, to determine the financial uh, feasibility of establishing a city. Um, and so there would be a detailed analysis to determine whether that would, uh, it could pay for its the services that it would need to pay for. And then there would be a vote after that. So it really, and then if there are boundary changes, they also would go through LAFCO, uh, for example, of, uh, of uh, special districts or the creation of them. So it, it has a somewhat independent role in terms of um, it, it, the work that it does. But in, in a city uh, situation, it would be ultimately the city voters that would approve the city. So it's it, it's mainly kind of a, an agency that helps analyze the imp impacts of uh, the uh, establishment of a city. Um, and um, cities don't even have to provide all the services. They can contract with the county for certain services. So there are possibilities for uh, uh, joint powers uh, kind of agreements 
between cities and counties for provision of, for example, uh, law enforcement, uh, that kind of thing. So can you talk about the law enforcement contract with Sonoma and Windsor and um yeah, my understanding, and I don't know the details of it, is that the town of Windsor, rather than having its own police department, does contract with the sheriff's department to provide law enforcement. So this is a way for a city to be able to, uh, I guess you'd say, um, more economically and efficiently provide a public service. Um, and uh, yeah, so it, it does provide that kind of opportunity. We did have a question. <clears throat> from somebody wanting to know if the classes are recorded and how um, earlier classes could be accessed. And if you, yes, it is recorded. And if you go to our YouTube channel, um, you can find the recording of the two previous cl uh, classes. Um, there was a comment by a viewer about acknowledging that our county library is a special district funded primarily by property taxes. So, yeah. Um, and let's, I'm sorry, go ahead. I, I did want to mention because um, I wanted to leave time for questions, of course. Um, uh, but uh, the uh, I know I went through some of the material rather quickly, but I wanted to make sure that it is um, communicated, but also um, it's recorded. And so the information, of course, is accessible to people to be able to um, look at again if they would like to. Um, to be able to get more of the details that I provided today. Thank you. Um, uh, who's responsible for road infrastructure in unincorporated areas? Uh, the county is. Um, and um, so, you know, the city's responsibility really ends at the, at the city limits line. But of course, um, you need to keep a road uh, go, going from the city into the county. And uh, you don't want to go from four lanes to two lanes <laughs> right at the city limit line. So there is, of course, uh, coordination um, in terms of transportation. But uh, there is a department in, in the county which handles roads and would also handle other types of, um, you know, traffic uh, controls. Um, and uh, of course, bikeways um, and uh, pedestrian improvements and so on. So it would be the county that would be um, the provider of those kinds of services and, and facilities uh, in the unincorporated areas. And that would be the same for any wildfire land management? Yes, I believe so. Okay. Um, a question about advocating for a project. Uh, what's the best way to advocate for a project? Uh, staff, elected officials directly, city employees, all the above? That is such a good question. And I thought I have thought about that um, recently. Uh, where do you go? Um, sure, you can talk to your local official. Um, you, you know, um, but I think oftentimes the process I would go through would be to um, look at the organization of your local government um, and the departments. You can get a tremendous amount of information uh, just by uh, going online and looking up the department. For example, um, if you go online in, in our city, you can, and you have an issue in a public uh, with, with park maintenance, for example, you can go online and you can um, uh, show where you, or live or where this problem exists. And then you can mark it on a map. You can write notes that will describe the issue. And then the it will be then um, communicated to members of the staff. And so in that case, you didn't need to call your city council member and say, you know, this park really looks terrible or whatever it is. Um, so and this can be the same with an issue regarding um, uh, your, your uh, road or a need for, let's say, a uh, flashers in a pedestrian for pedestrians. Um, you can look and see where the where the program is located in the city's structure. See what needs to be done uh, to be able to solve the problem. I I like to call staff people. Uh, after I look for that information myself and try to figure out how things are done. And that would be my first step. My first step would not be to call uh, the mayor. 
Um, they're involved with so many different issues that um, I think um, I reserve, I personally reserve those kind of calls for um, when I really can't uh, get <laughs> satisfaction on an issue. And I don't know that I've ever called the mayor directly and said, hey, I need help on this. Um, I work with the staff people as much as possible. I find them helpful. Um, these days, of course, a lot of people are working, um, you know, not necessarily in the office. And so you might have to leave a message and wait a day for a response. But I think it is really um, important because they're, they're, they know more than anybody really about the specifics of an issue. And if you call the mayor and say, hey, I have a problem with this particular issue, they'll probably refer you to the staff person to, to say, hey, you know, they could probably solve it for you. Um, so I think um, knowing the way your city or county is structured and learning about that, and, and you can establish a relationship with the staff folks as well. I mean, obviously, they're not going to give you all their time. They're busy doing many projects at the same time. But, um, you know, if, if you have an issue with... Um, you know, a problem in your neighborhood um, uh, regarding uh, the building that is, uh, you know, built was built uh, non conforming to the city codes. You know, there's a, there's ways to uh, deal with reporting that kind of thing. So I would personally start with learning about the city, how it works, what the departments are, and then going from there. So another question about um, annexation. Um, the question has to do with why are there islands of unincorporated land within Santa Rosa? Okay, well... Sorry, sorry, it, Steve. <laughs> why, why, why is that? Uh, well, you know, cities don't necessarily start with the boundaries that they wind up with. We know that. Um, cities will start with the residents who want to incorporate and create that city. Um, but over time, areas are added to the city. And so there are annexations done, often um, supported by um, property owners or developers who want to build a subdivision and connect to city uh, services like water and sewer and get city roads and sidewalks. Um, and so oftentimes the annexations that happen are incremental and don't always include all of the parcels that um, are in the area uh, within the city. And the other, the other thing is sometimes areas are annexed by cities because they provide certain tax advantages. I mean, cities want sales taxes. Sales taxes are probably the most mm, viable source of funds that cities can uh, obtain. Property taxes are limited from Prop 13. Um, and um, do not really provide the majority of the funds that come into cities. It's really sales taxes that that provide, um, in addition to intergovernmental funds, you know, grants and so on. So um, sometimes cities will, um, you know, annex areas that will provide the tax revenues. Um, and uh, so anyway, cities grow kind of incrementally and not always logically, um, I would say. Um, so there are areas, sometimes they're left behind, and a lot of people like not being in the city, even though um, they could get city water or sewer, um, they would have to pay for the water and sewer lines. There are different rules on um, having animals um, on your property and so on. So there are people who live within the confines of the city or the general uh, outlines of the city, but who don't necessarily want to be in the city limits. So it, it's, it's kind of a mixed bag, I guess, of why people want to stay in the county, the county, <laughs> oh, um, or be in the city. Um, and so anyway, islands do uh, pop up <laughs> within the city. And it's complicated because, uh, you know, um, the services are provided. Um, become a little more challenging uh, with the uh, fact that you have uh, different jurisdictions. I will say that. In a perfect world, all the, within a city, all the properties would be within the municipality. But that's not how things necessarily work. Um, so a question related back to talking to staff. Uh, what's the difference between the role of staff and the role of city council members? And do council members manage staff? Yeah, another very good question. Um, 
So the city council in cities like ours, where you have a, a city manager, a council manager form, which is the most common form, um, the city council uh, in our situation will hire a city manager and a city attorney. Those are the only two positions that the city council has direct authority over, I guess you would say. Um, we, the city council members, I almost said we, uh, <laughs> the, uh, we used to. No, the city council um, does not hire the department heads, the head of the recreation and parks or the head of uh, the water department or finance or so on. It's the city manager who is given that authority to hire department heads. Um, and the city council does evaluate the performance regularly, at least annually, of the city manager and the city attorney, um, and has the uh, both the power to hire and fire um, um, the uh, people in those positions. Um, but the staff is not necessarily in the direct line of the city council to control their activities. The council's role really is policy is to adopt policies and goals and budgets that will be then administered by the city manager. That's not to say that the city council members have zero contact with the, the staff, but really the, the theory of council manager form of government is that the council members um, and uh, will will we'll work with the city manager and the city manager is really the the conduit to the city staff. Um, but there are there are obviously contacts between staff members and city council members. So when I was on the council, the people I had the most contact with were the department heads. They would come to the uh, the meetings and they would um, present information on the general plan update or the city's finances. Uh, uh, maybe they would have other staff members with them, but there, it would always be the the uh, directors of the departments that were there. Um, but I'll tell you one thing. Yes. I when I see a city staff member cleaning up a you know a park or working on putting in a new uh, water line. I always thank them for their work because they are the people out there who are doing the work for us. So I think it's very important to recognize that without them, we would not have a functioning uh, city or county. It's the staff folks who are out there doing the work for us. Well, as a former city employee, thank you. <laughs> no, no, thank you. <laughs> no, thank you. <laughs> um, I couple questions um, about the civil grand jury and how it interfaces with Sonoma County government. Well, I, I don't know all the details of that, but the grand jury um, it does have independence uh, and can investigate different aspects, um, programs, actions of the county and issues a report uh, based on their findings. And then the, the public agency does have a responsibility to respond to the grand jury. And then what happens next is, is not always clear to me in terms of to what extent that the local government has to comply with all of the recommendations of the grand jury, but the grand, they take the grand jury reports very seriously. Um, you have to. Um, and uh, we're talking about civil grand juries. We're not talking about criminal grand juries, which is a different thing. Uh, but we, but it is uh, essential, of course, for the local government to respond and do their best to satisfy with the findings of the grand jury, because that's why you have people appointed to grand juries who are, are doing the, the business of, of, of the community. Um, and what's the connection between the general plan that cities and the county adopt and the state? It's a requirement by the state of California that all jurisdictions like cities and counties have a general plan. And um, the general plan basically includes both goals and policies as well as um, population uh, and uh, employment forecasts, which are considered as part of the general plan. One important part of the general plan is the housing. 
because of the fact that housing has become such an issue in California. Um, the city and county are both responsible, at least every eight years, to adopt a regional to adopt a housing element for their jurisdiction. And that then, um, and that's where the, it interfaces with the work of the of ABAG, the regional agency I mentioned earlier, because ABAG, which represents cities and counties, gets population uh, and uh, housing projections from the state, um, and then they are allocated to different jurisdictions. And the general plans have a big impact in terms of how much um, housing is allocated in the in the plan for housing. And when I'm talking about housing, I'm talking about low income, moderate income and higher income type housing, um, which is numerically determined within that housing needs allocation that is done by ABEC. So uh, the general plan is uh, a document that includes land use considerations, commercial property, industrial, different types of residential, public, property and so on, which you'll see on the general plan map with policies on how those kinds of um, uh, land uses are adopted and implemented. Uh, and that leads to the zoning code that it gets more specific in terms of requirements of uh, buildings that are um, allowed. And of course, that's where the city council and the board of supervisors have authority in terms of interpreting the general plan when those kind of developments come before them. But they are required and uh, by the state, and they're really like a guiding document that helps um, us as residents and also um, the governments to be able to plan for the, the growth in the areas. So they're, they're an essential part of what cities do. And so they um, also can be amended. Um, they, they're not necessarily, uh, you know, there for 10 or more years without being amended. Uh, just as an example, the Southeast Greenway project I, I mentioned, we did a general plan amendment. And that then uh, was also uh, had to go through the CEQA, California Environmental Quality Act, which analyzed the economic, uh, the environmental impacts of that general plan amendment. And so general plans are under um, the authority of the state in terms of CEQA as well. But anyway, they are a, a extremely important part of the process and a wonderful opportunity for people to get involved with when they happen, because there will inevitably be meetings in your community uh, that will be run by the planning department, which take input and uh, encourage people to get involved in the general plan process if they can. Uh, great. Well, we have two last questions that are kind of Procedural type questions. Uh oh. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I don't hear you, Karen. I'm sorry. Oh, sorry. Can you hear me now? Yes. Okay. As an elected official, do you get training on just what all is enta entailed in governing? No, not just that. Um, you know, when you are elected to office, you meet with the city manager and you meet department heads and you learn about just the process of how government works. Um, and you are on subcommittees dealing with the budget or land use or housing or those kinds of things. But you're also, uh, there are also annual trainings um, that you have on, for example, conflict of interest um, uh, that will, uh, be uh, or essential to being a member of the city council because there are some very strict laws regarding um, your um, necessity to not vote on matters that could affect you personally in terms of your finances. Um, and also there are some very strict requirements in terms of the need to um, meet in public um, and not have private meetings behind the scenes with other uh, members of your elected uh, body. If a majority of the members of an elected body meet or even email each other uh, behind the scenes uh, on a particular issue, um, it, 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 could, it could violate state 
law. So it's something to be very careful about, both in terms of taking any, you know, um, any uh, gift or uh, I didn't even let anybody buy me a cup of coffee when I was on the city council, you know. Um, but so, I, you know, I, I think it's real important to be careful, but you do get training in those kind of issues as well, as well as staff, um, city and staff and public relations, because there are um, other, other trainings you get to um, uh, in terms of uh, racial and sexual uh, behavior that, you know, is uh, not legal. And um, so, you know, there are, there are trainings you go through uh, to really do your job uh, as a responsible member of, a, of an elected body. It's something you take very seriously. It's both an honor to be an elected official, and yet it is, uh, you really, uh, it's extremely important to um, make sure you do your job with respect for people and, you know, in a way that um, you uh, certainly follow the, the state laws. I think that's pretty obvious. So one final question um, from an attendee. And let me read this. I know the definition of policy, but when you say that, their role, meaning the council's role, is primarily to make policy. What does that mean? Well, I'm talking about, you know, like a, the general plan, for example. That's that. Th those are policies that are included in the, in the uh, uh, the general plan. And so, policies really are, are reflective of, you know, things like, you know, what kind of fees do you charge for use of recreational facilities or what do you do if someone builds a building that is uh, in violation of city codes? Um, you know, there, there are just different circumstances that can come before a, an elected body. What about housing? To what degree do you require affordable housing to be built on a particular property? Um, you know, uh, those are policies um, that you establish or fees that are um, uh, levied for um, buildings in terms of uh, payments to uh, cover the costs of roads or the cost of water or sewer lines, that kind of thing. So that's what I'm talking about. There's just many issues that come before you. And so your job really is to, to, uh, to a large part, to um, work on those kind of things. But a lot of the decisions that come before you deal with land use and development. Mm -hmm and budgets, so. And one of the big things that um, the council does is uh, involved with labor negotiations. Yes, and so I said the decisions have to be made in public, but there are certain issues that are not necessarily gonna be in front of the public. And one is labor negotiations. One is uh, acquisitions of property, for example, or sale of property or lawsuits that are uh, that the city or county might be involved with. So there are some issues that are legal to be talked about in closed session, uh, particularly lawsuits. Um, but like I said, real estate transactions as well. Yeah. Great. But otherwise, there's a big responsibility for the decisions to be made in public. And I think that's a very good thing. Yes. So I think that's it, my friend. Thank you so much for oh. doing this. And I think Thank that people you. out there can see why Steve be, got a Community Hero Award last year. Uh, well, um, thank you, Karen. I, I think you might have had something to do with that, but um, it's a pleasure, and uh, I, I'm, I'm I'm proud to be in front of you all. Um, and uh, I hope that um, you will find community work as rewarding as I do. I know many of you are already involved, and probably some of you who could teach this class instead of me, <laughs> but uh, I, I, uh, I encourage everyone to just find something that they really care about and to find a way to contribute to the community because, you know, I still remember certain things that I, I have done that um, give me great satisfaction. Even when I go past the green one, I see trees that uh, I help plant uh, or the fountain where kids are playing um, that I help, you know, create that a park. It's something that we all great get great benefit from, and it's it's a, it's a great experience to contribute to a community. Well, um, we have one last comment from somebody who is associated with the Ag and Open Space group oh, yeah. saying, "Thank you for all your hard work over the years." So, 
Um, yeah. And thank you to all the uh, uh, viewers today uh, for being in attendance. And um, please continue to check our website for any updates on any um, upcoming meetings that we may have. And and our thank, website. And thanks again to the league for oh. this. I'm sorry I interrupted you talking no, about that. That's so ch our website is lwvsonoma.org. So please uh, bookmark that and check back uh, occasionally. If Thank you. Good night. Good night, all.